word limit is 600. Do you still want like a formal introduction and conclusion? Because that might take up most of it, or do you just want us to go right into the prompt? I would just make it a short intro, okay. uh, you know, a short, an intro of about 100, 150 words. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But yeah, I'd say try to structure it along the same lines that you would any other essay. Any other questions about the paper coming up? Nope. Thanks for reminding me that that's due Monday. Um, but uh, yeah, that's right. I actually gave you assignments. <laughs> yeah, lucky you, right? Well, at least you don't have the the two like six page papers that I gave to the classes last time around too. Oh, so. Yeah, so yeah, I uh, be how long this one case something you said you didn't know. What, what'd you say? How long is like I know how long the paper is, but other people didn't know how long. <laughs> well, how many of the seven pages? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it should be like 600 to 700 words or so, and um, it should be so that would that would be basically about two and a half pages, I think, right. So I actually got a uh, good news from my dissertation chair because he loved my 90 page chapter that I turned in, uh, in, in January, just a few weeks ago. So, uh, he loved it and it looks like I will probably be defending my dissertation in just a couple months and then I'll be officially minted PhD. So very exciting. And then after that, I'll give you guys the 90 page projects, right? <laughs> Okay, well, let's, let's get to it here. So we're talking about political parties and elections and campaigns today. Uh, but before we do that, I did want to just briefly look at some of the things we didn't get to talk about in our lecture last time. Because uh, this is important enough to make sure that I uh, say some things about it. But I really want to breeze through this. I don't want to spend too much time on the great society and contemporary liberalism because it's just... Uh, uh, we, we need to get into our new unit. So some of the highlights that I would have spent more time on last lecture. The Great Society, what is it? Well, the Great Society is the name for Lyndon Johnson's political programs in the 1960s. He was a liberal democratic president. And he, he won at a moment when there was unusual sympathy for the Democrats and for liberalism generally. So there was a death of a president in the 1960s. Uh, who knows which, which president died in the 1960s? Famous, famous conspiracy theory, like assassination event. JFK, right? So we have to keep that in mind. JFK was just assassinated in 1963. And JFK, he, he wasn't uh, especially radical, uh, but... Nonetheless, he did have a liberal political program that he wanted to advance. And when JFK is killed, there's basically just a lot of sympathy for the Democrats. In 1964, there's the feeling that, well, we don't really want to change presidents three times in the span of four years, because that's what you would do if you vote for someone to replace Johnson. Um, you'd have you know, three different presidents in the span of four years. <clears throat> And so Johnson comes in with a huge advantage because a lot of people are thinking, well, he's going to realize our martyred president's agenda if he wins office. He's going to really bring to fruition JFK's plans because that's what he ran on. And then you also saw that in 1964, the election where LBJ was on the ballot, the Republicans are unusually weak. Uh, and this actually is related to what we're talking about today, political parties, right? And so the Republicans are very weak in 64 because they nominate a candidate that really divides the party, um, a guy named Barry Goldwater. And he was a very conservative candidate, but he made it clear that if you were a more moderate Republican, he didn't want you in the party and you needed to get out, right? So the Republicans are pretty divided and you see a lot of Republicans vote for LBJ. You see a lot of other people just vote for LBJ because they don't want to change leaders. And so LBJ has a very enviable situation for a president. He's able to really shake up government. He has a super majority of Democrats in the Congress, and he's the president. And so he, he has a very ambitious 
Great Society program. And the Great Society should be understood as really the third wave of progressivism. We've talked about the first wave of progressivism, which is essentially just the original progressives and their criticisms of the Constitution. We've talked about the second wave of progressivism, which is the New Deal and its innovation of economic rights. And the Great Society is really meant to be the third wave, where you add into this discussion not only the emphasis on economic rights that FDR had, but you also add in focus on LBJ talks about how the federal government, we need to be involved in making sure all of our citizens feel a sense of belonging to their community and all of our citizens are in tune with nature. And we need to make sure that they all have a kind of a spiritual fulfillment provided by the government, right? And so LBJ, he wants us to not only have economic rights, which he provides for in programs like Medicare, which is government health care for the poor or uh, for the elderly, uh, Medicaid, which is government health care for the poor, and food stamps, which is a kind of a welfare program for the poor. So he he wants to promote this economic rights idea that FDR had earlier advanced by doing more to help the poor or at least that's the claim, uh, whether it actually helps the poor is debatable, but you know, at least the claim is that we're helping the poor with these government programs. And he also wants the government to pick up uh, sort of new identity type issues. And so this is when issues like gay rights emerge and issues like uh, feminism. And that brings us to the next prong of this poll that I would have uh, talked about last week if we'd have had more time. So in the 60s, we see that equality becomes radicalized in some ways. Um, so in the 1960s, there's a lot of concern about things like civil rights, understandably so, right? So this is at a moment whenever there's real backlash against things like segregation for African-Americans. And more and more Americans are thinking we have to do more to promote equality. Well, it turns out that there was a spectrum of beliefs about just what equality means. There were some Americans, including many people on the civil rights movement team, that said, well, so here's our idea of the civil rights movement. We want to have the same political rights that white people do. We want black citizens to be able to vote. We want black citizens to be able to have a fair jury trial by a jury of their peers. We just want to have all the same rights that white people already have. So that was one position. But there was a more radical position that said, we want to have total social equality. Uh, we want to have not only the same political rights, but we want to have all the same social opportunities that white people have. And this is where you get ideas like affirmative action. And this is where you get ideas like um, reparations for Black Americans, because the logic is, well, you know, we've been disenfranchised. We've been put down for so long that the only way to make this fair is by, you know, paying us reparations for the crime of slavery all those years ago. And so you can see how social equality is more radical than just a limited political equality movement. Well, that same issue emerges with feminism. So I'm sure some of you have heard of the three waves of feminism. Uh, so the first wave feminist, the second wave feminist, and the third wave feminist. Uh, so the first wave feminists are the original feminists. They're the OG feminists, right? So uh, the, the Susan B. Anthony's and the Elizabeth Cady Stanton's. The first wave feminists, they're very much like that kind of moderate civil rights group that I mentioned earlier. So what the first wave feminists were saying in the 1800s and in the early 1900s was, we just want to have the right to vote. We just want to have all the same political rights that you already give men. Uh, but what they're not saying, though, is that women and men need to be the same or they need to do the same things. Um, the first wave feminists are not saying that we don't like being mothers and we don't like being stay at home moms and we don't like wearing dresses. So these are not claims made by the, the first wave feminists. Well, the second wave feminists who emerge in the 60s, people like Betty Friedan, uh, The Feminine Mystique, a very influential second wave feminist book at this time, uh, they criticize that early feminism because they think, you know, you're, you're just not going far enough because what really keeps women down is 
our lack of social opportunities. Um, and so it's not enough to say we just need the right to vote, because if you still are contenting yourself with being a stay at home mom and with not having all the same job opportunities that men have, well, you're fundamentally limiting women's rights. Um, and this is also where abortion, abortion rights come from, by the way. So you can imagine that if your big concern is that women and men, we want to make sure they have the same careers. So we want to make sure that women are put into law schools on an equal footing with men. We want to make sure that uh, women are given the same uh, educational opportunities that men are given. Uh, well, you, you can imagine that if you want women and men to have all the same opportunities going into their career, what does pregnancy do to this? Does pregnancy in some ways like hinder a woman from being a career woman, at, le at least in some ways? It does a little bit, right? I mean, not, not permanently, but you know that's nine months where you're bearing a child and that's nine months where your body is not as physically like capable of doing a lot of labor as, you know, maybe a, a male who doesn't have to worry about pregnancy does. And so this is why the second wave feminists emphasized abortion, because they wanted to see women be in careers, and they didn't want to see women be stay-at-home moms. They thought that was a kind of tyranny. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the big takeaway about contemporary liberalism, is the movement away from mere political rights and political equality and towards a more sweeping view of like social equality. I mean, uh, real equality between men and women, it's not just women and men both have to have the right to vote and they need to have the same political rights under the constitution. Real equality would be women and men in the same occupations, women and men having all the same opportunities. And so you can see that with second wave feminism, that's where a lot of Christians kind of you know, move a, a, a away, I think, from the feminist language because, you know, Christians don't like abortion, right? And they, uh, Christian women, including women who have careers and like to work, um, you know, these are women that generally like being mothers and don't see that as some kind of bad thing. So the second wave feminism was very controversial. And then you get a third wave feminism in the 90s, which is where you get the idea of sort of gender constructivism, the idea that, well, gender is a social construct and it's, it's really just a kind of Marxist feminism where their focus is on the intersectionality, which is a fancy word for a simple idea. Like, uh, you don't need to know that word, but um, their focus on intersectionality means that they, they emphasize the oppression of women and Black Americans and gay Americans and trans Americans, like all the different oppressed groups uh, they see as being related to the oppression of women. And so third wave is kind of the most radical feminism. There's actually an interesting debate between like second wave feminists today, like people who identify with the second wave feminism and people who identify with the third wave feminism because the third wavers are much more open to things like trans women in women's sports. Whereas the second wave feminists, I mean, we as Christians might think they have some problems, but they did generally emphasize like women doing these things, like women need to be in sports. and. So someone like J.K. Rowling, who's been mired in controversy because of some of her anti-trans statements that she's made, well, she's she's kind of a second wave feminist and the third wave feminists don't like her. So you kind of see this debate on the left today between the different wings of, femi of feminism. So does that make sense, kind of the differences between these groups? Okay, well, let's get to the topic of the day. Political parties. And I have a video for you to ease us into this discussion because The Simpsons is the best educational tool. Where's the sound? Milana, why'd you break the sound? I just did it, you know. Yeah. Trying to thwart me. Is there a button on like the panel that's the unmute? Yeah. Um the audio mute is not on. That's that's bizarre. I don't understand that. Oh well. It's a funny video where uh, the two aliens, Kang and Krom, 
it's not as funny. I'll, I'll try to I'll I'll try to play it next time. It's only one minute long. Um, but yeah, so what the video is is uh you know the two aliens are running for president and you know uh, someone's like, well, you don't want to vote for them because they're hideous space aliens. And he's like, well, you have to vote for one of us because it's a two party system. What are you going to do? Vote third party and throw your vote away. And then they end up enslaved to the alien because they could only vote for the two aliens for president. It's a great video. But uh, I like it because it speaks to our frustration that we sometimes have with our two party system. Right. It seems arbitrary to many voters. We look at it and we're like, where's the choice? Why can't I vote for the Green Party or the Libertarian Party or the the Socialist Party or these other third parties that emerge from time to time. So we're going to talk today about that and about the possible advantages of the two-party system, as well as some of their drawbacks. So just in short, what is a political party? Well, a political party is an institution that is trying to elect candidates for office. It's really that simple. So parties are organizations, and they're the, the way that people are sent to government with a program. Uh, parties often draw up political platforms and parties organize issues for voters. Parties have been called by some people the indispensable organizers of democracy. And this may come as a surprise to us because I think that many of us, including me at various times in my life, I've uh, looked at parties with some, some skepticism. You know, isn't this just of a kind of organized hatred, right? I remember back to way back in the first day of the semester, whenever I talked about like the nature of politics and how there were people like Henry Adams that said that politics is nothing more than the systematic organization of hatred. Well, you know, you kind of see the, the inflamed violent fighting between political parties today. And you wonder, well, isn't that just what parties are? It's just a way to organize hatreds. But no, we're gonna see in today's talk, the parties do play really important functions in American democracy. In many ways, I think it's impossible to understand American democracy if you don't understand political parties and their history and where they've come from and what they do today. One interesting thing that I really want you to take away from the Rosenbluth reading and the Shapiro reading is, especially is their idea that Political partisanship today is so bad precisely because parties are so weak, right? And as we mentioned going over the quiz, this seems surprising on the surface because if you look at Congress, if you look at how people vote in Congress, well, the Republicans almost always vote lockstep and the Democrats almost always vote lockstep. You don't have a lot of crossover voting. You don't have a lot of bipartisanship. And in the states... You don't have as much um, uh, you don't you don't have as much split ticket voting, which is what happens whenever you might vote for the Republican for president, but maybe the Democrat for governor. You know that doesn't happen as much as it used to. And so on the surface, it looks like parties are strong because well, you know the Republicans all vote the same way and the Democrats all vote the same way. But actually, political parties are unusually weak. They're, they've probably never been weaker in American history. And so that's a, a news that might be very surprising to people. More and more people identify as independents today, which is something that attests to the weakness of political parties. Um, how many of you are registered independents? And I, I, I'm not going to hold that against you if you are. But no one no one is an independent here? Okay, yeah, um, well... Usually in my classes, a lot of people raise their hand, actually. Um, and uh, the the logic of most independents is, well, you know, I don't want to be tied down to just one party because I want to think about all the issues, right, and think about them independently. The problem for independents um, is that being an independent sometimes comes with certain costs, right? So we have direct primaries, like it or not. We have direct primaries that choose candidates. For office. And if you're an independent, uh, there are some states that allow independents to vote in Republican primaries or Democrat primaries, but in a lot of states, independents can't vote in primary elections, right? And there's a kind of logic to that. 
that might be frustrating to someone if they're an independent that maybe leans Republican, right? Because it's like, well, you know, I kind of want to still vote for the Republican uh, primary. Uh, I want to choose Trump or Haley or something like that. Uh, so it's frustrating to you if you are a Democrat leaning independent or a Republican leaning independent. But there's actually a logic to what's called the closed primary, where you keep independence away from these primary elections. The logic is that if you're a Republican, you don't want Democrats or Democrat leaning independents choosing your candidates. You want people choosing your candidates who are committed to the principles of your party. And they're more likely to do that if they're, they have to be registered as a Republican to vote in the Republican primary. So there are actually some very high profile examples in recent political elections of, uh, you know, actually Republicans trying to like affect the Democratic primaries because they want to choose the weakest candidate for the Democrats that they can beat in the general election. So, for example, in 2008, Rush Limbaugh, he tried to mobilize his Republican leaning audience to vote in the Democratic primary in some of these open primary states. And he wanted them to vote for Hillary over Obama. Because he's like, we can beat Hillary. She's going to be easier to beat than Obama. So you need to storm the Democratic primaries and help choose her as the Democratic candidate. And so you could see why this would be a problem for you if you're a committed Republican. Do you want Democrats to choose your, your nominees? Uh, do you want, and if you're a Democrat, do you want Republicans or Republican sympathetic people to choose your nominees? Uh, so the fact that we have so many states that allow this kind of thing, that that attests to the weakness of political parties, where, I mean, you know, direct primaries in general weaken parties. But in some of these states, they're going to say, we don't even want you to be a registered Republican to vote in our primaries um, or a registered Democrat. We're not even going to ask that of you. Um, but that that is that is a cost of being an independent in some states. If you're an independent in some states, you can't vote in primary elections which is a cost that I think, as I said, I think it makes some sense. I mean, if you don't want to commit yourself to that party, I don't know what gives you a right to choose that party's candidates. And so getting back to that uh, Shapiro and Rosenbluth essay, partisanship is vicious, and that's because political parties are weak. What was the basic line of reasoning here? Does anyone remember from this essay? What kind of party is a strong party? Yeah, Micah? Uh, one with cohesion and a broad, like, reach of people. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, um, there's, a sen there's definitely a sense in which more centralization in the party leadership strengthens the party. Um, and yeah, yes, absolutely. So a strong party is one that has a coherent policy platform um, you know, it says, if you vote for the Republicans, you can expect us to vote exactly this way on these issues. Um, today, it sort of appears like we have that where, yeah, I mean, most Republicans agree on gun control, for example, but we actually don't have binding party platforms anymore. 2020 was the first presidential election ever where the Republican Party didn't even bother drafting a party platform, which to me symbolizes that their idea as well. I mean, we just agree with whatever Trump wants us to agree with at this point. I mean, the official reason given was COVID. That's why they didn't draft it. But, you know, I mean, party platforms seem to mean less and less because the, the platform doesn't actually bind the members of that party to vote a certain way. And so they offer a coherent platform to the voters. And as you said, Micah, they're also a big tent operation. If you want to be a successful political party, you have to appeal to the most voters that you possibly can. You can't just appeal to the more radical, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez types on the Democratic side or on the Republican side, the Margaret Taylor Greene types, the very, very, very like ultra Trumpist candidates. Uh, a healthy and strong Republican party would agree on the general principles of something like limited government and individual liberty and uh, this kind of thing. But it would want to attract as many voters into that fold as possible. And sometimes that means 
that you bring in people that agree with you on general principles, but that also, um, you know, don't agree on all the particulars of a question. So, uh, you know, I think in a stronger Republican Party, you'd be able to see a little bit more internal debate on Ukraine, for example. Like, what should we do about the Ukraine? Should we fund it? Should we not fund it? Uh, today, it seems like there's not really a lot of room for debate about these issues. And so the point of this essay was really just to show that political partisanship is actually bad because of how weak parties are. Um, the partisanship that we see, it's not because parties are strong. It's because parties are very weak. The parties are controlled by the more fringe and extreme elements of each party. And that means that they're going to be a little more vicious in their hatred for one another. Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of moderates in party leadership anymore. And the thing they blame for this, of course, is direct primaries, right? Uh, direct primaries help extreme candidates. What kind of Republican voters do you think vote in Republican primaries? And what kind of Democrat voters do you think vote in Democrat primaries? Do you think it's kind of the, the wishy-washy moderate types? Yeah, no, right? I mean, it's it's the the partisans like me that you know really are like, oh, we gotta we gotta mobilize for this candidate for that reason, and you know the the people that are a little more ideological, uh, for better or worse. Um, but in in any case, primaries tend to give the more extreme candidates an advantage uh, than than a more traditional system of party nominations would. So I want to look at this interesting passage from Coolidge, because I think it sets a great tone for us to consider as we explore the party system. Caden, would you mind reading this uh, Coolidge passage for me? The tendency of recent use has been to break down party discipline and weaken party authority. It has not improved the quality of our government. We need more party solidarity, not less. We need more self-sacrificing party loyalty and less personal political selfishness. When men in public office feel that they are justified in pursuing their own course without regard to the opinions of their associates, the authority of the government is weakened and brought into disrepute. Yeah, so I wanted to highlight this quote. Thank you, Caden. I wanted to highlight this quote because I think that even though it was written in 1934, it very much speaks to issues that we see happen all the time today on both sides, like in both the Republican and the Democratic Party. You often see what he refers to as this personal political selfishness, um, where we're going to break down the unity of the Republican Party for the sake of winning you know, political points with our district or something. So just to bring to mind a recent example of this, Kevin McCarthy was forced out of the Speaker of the House position by six Republicans in the whole Republican conference. So you had about 200 something that favor keeping McCarthy and you had six that wanted to kick him out. Well, the six get their way because they work with the Democrats. And so the you Coolidge, I think, would look at that and say, well, that's personal political selfishness. Because what Matt Gates really cared about, it wasn't unifying the Republican Party and helping us to accomplish an agenda that the voters want. Matt Gates wants to run for governor after Florida or after Ron DeSantis leaves office. And so he wants to gain a national profile by kicking out Kevin McCarthy and being a more pro-Trump candidate, supposedly, than McCarthy was. And so that's an example of weak parties in action. I mean, in a strong party, you'd never be able to see the sitting Speaker of the House forced out by six dissidents in the party. Micah, did you have a question? Yeah, so didn't the founders kind of bank on personal political selfishness to be, I mean, to be to be like used for good, like they would want to do the people running for offices would want to do what the people like need or want, so they uh -huh. get the office to, because of a selfish reason. And so, wouldn't a resolve to what he's kind of saying the problem with the party system or the parties would be to just get rid of the parties and have people? Try to line up the like individuals. Try to line up with as many people as possible, and instead of trying to fix the system of parties in it, if that makes sense. So is Coolidge trying to say that, or um, yeah? So the founders and selfishness. 
I get exactly what you're saying with how the founders emphasize these things like the separation of powers and the factious propensities of man and how the founders are aware that all human beings are going to be self-interested. But I do think there's a lot of dedication to the common good um, from the founders. The founders want to do what's good for the whole community, not just like what's good for our district, right? We talked about how for the founders, uh, friendship was the basis of the constitution, the spirit of friendship that Washington talked about. Um, and so I don't, I don't think it's exactly fair to them to say that they are banking on selfishness completely. I think there are other high motives too. Um, but this question of the parties and what Coolidge is saying, I think that Coolidge is actually wanting to do the same thing that the founders are, but he wants to do it through political parties. He doesn't see them as, an, as a threat to it. Um, he, he wants good government for the common good. And he thinks that parties are going to advance the common good because you're putting a bunch of different people together and you're forcing them to have dialogue and conversation about what kinds of policies would help the voters. And you're linking the people to the government. Uh, you're actually giving the people a way to organize themselves and to make their voice heard in government. Um, but I think that Coolidge's concern is with these types that, so just to place it in context, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about in his context, we see this all the time now, but like in his context, there was a movement to draft him for the presidential nomination again in 1932. He had been a retired president for four years and Herbert Hoover succeeded him, his fellow Republican Herbert Hoover, he succeeded him to the White House and Hoover is not in good shape. He's very unpopular because the Great Depression hit during his presidency and he's blamed for the depression. And there are Republicans that are trying to draft Coolidge for the 1932 nomination and kick the sitting Republican president off the ballot. And Coolidge is responding to that draft movement. He's saying, if I care about the good of the Republican Party, the last thing I would do is run against the sitting Republican president. You know, I should want to unify the party around him and help him. And I, I think this would be personal political selfishness for me to step in and try to seize the nomination from a fellow Republican. So that's what he's talking about when he's talking about party harmony. I don't know if that totally answered your question. Uh, did it? Yeah, we can talk more about that later if you'd like. Um, so need to move on though. So these are, so why have political parties? I mean, have we not seen someone of imminent stature like George Washington? George Washington didn't like political parties. What did Washington say about parties? Well, he says that they will be animated by a spirit of revenge. One party will win power and it'll be out to hurt the other party. He says that they'll be factious. They won't be interested in what's good for the whole nation. So why is Washington missing something perhaps? Well, Coolidge thinks he is missing something and other, other people think he's missing something because political parties and democracy, they go hand in hand. You can't really find a working national democracy in the world without political parties. So it's not like America is the only country with a party system. I mean, if you have a democratic system, you're going to have parties naturally emerge, right? Because people, it turns out, don't agree on everything. And if you have a democracy where the people are in charge of the government, you have to have a way for the people to organize themselves and make a difference in public policy. Do you think that North Korea has political parties or Cuba or uh, even, even a state like Russia, which sort of has these shadow parties that aren't really real opposition, right? Yeah, so like that's Coolidge's point is you don't really have democracy if you don't have any parties. Parties emerge whenever you have a democratic system that cares about the consent of the people. So what do parties do? One understated advantage of political parties is how they simplify issues for voters. So many of you have voted, I'm sure. And how many of you would say that you, you know every single person on the ballot? So not just looking at the presidential ballot, but like all the down ballot races, you know, the city council, officer that's running, the school board officer that's running, the attorney general of your state that's running. Do you guys have any awareness of like who these people are and 
like what their political careers were like. I know I haven't, right? I mean, uh, sometimes I vote for my best friend for the the local water commissioner or something, just because it's like, I, I don't even know who I'm voting for, so I might as well just write in my best friend for it. Um, so that's uh, that's what party, so parties are your way around that, right? So you don't have any idea who this um, Doug Johnson fellow is that's, run, is that a real person? I just made it up. Yeah, so I was making up a name, uh, but yeah. So some random guy named Doug Johnson is your attorney general candidate for the state government. You have no idea what his political career was. You don't know who he is. You've never met him. So how do you know who to vote for? Um, so political parties, they simplify things for the voters because you know that if there's an R after that guy's name or a D after that guy's name, you have a general idea of what they think, what, they're, what they are all about. Um, actually, that water commissioner officer I just was making fun of, that's that's the only ballot on the North Carolina state ballot that's like a nonpartisan officer. So like all the people, I don't even know, they, they don't have a party affiliation. So it's like, well, I don't have any idea who to vote for here. So I'm going to vote for my friend. And that's an example of how parties clarify things because they tell you, OK, so if he's the Republican guy, he probably believes in these general principles. If he's the Democrat, he probably believes in these other general principles. Because it's unrealistic to expect the voters to know all these candidates on an individual basis. It's unrealistic to expect them to like be able to do all the research for every single officer that's on the ballot and know, okay, so here's what he's voted for in the past. Here's who he is. Uh, parties simplify things for voters by giving us an idea of what they stand for, even if we've never met them and we are not familiar with who they are as people. Now, the danger of that, before we get to the next point, they, they have that function of simplifying the candidates and the issues for the voters, but there's also a danger to this, right? Because it turns out that just because you're a Republican, you don't always think the same way as other Republicans and vice versa with Democrats too. I mean, not all Democrats think alike on every single issue. And so you sometimes have Republicans that, you know, might might be for some limited gun control. And you wouldn't get that just from their R on the ballot. And so that's the danger of how they simplify issues as well. It turns out that people are complicated and even some Republicans don't agree with members of their party on everything else. Oh, how did we get to that slide? Yeah, so they simplify the issues for voters. Okay, a number, another good thing. Political parties help to educate the people. They're a way of making people want to participate in government. Um, so if you're someone who is a partisan, like me, I am a partisan. I, I very strongly believe in the principles and the heritage of the Republican Party. Uh, if you're someone like that, you might be more scared of the Democratic Party or the and vice versa. If you're a very committed Democrat, you'll be more uh, willing to mobilize against the Republicans. Um, and so party loyalty, it's it's something that encourages citizens to be active in politics and to do their homework on the issues and to go after candidates uh, that they think are going to be bad for the state. And so political parties are pretty good for deterring voter apathy. Uh, they're good for encouraging civic participation. So a couple of other things. I, I probably should rush through this because we're a little short on time here. Political parties have to be, even today with how weak parties are, they have to be somewhat of a big tent organization. And parties have to force, or parties serve as a way to force diverse groups of voters to work together uh, for the same candidate, even if they disagree on a lot of things, right? So think of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is a coalition of a lot of really different kinds of voters, right? I mean, you have your your trans rights voters, you have your homosexual voters, but you also have them working together with uh, Hispanic Catholics and Jews and Irish Catholics and secular humanist atheist types. So you have all these different groups that are a part of the Democratic coalition and they all have to work together for the sake of electing their candidates. That means that the Democratic Party 
it has to be at least somewhat open to the the views of so so the democratic party as much as the secular humanist atheist wing of it would want to make america a state atheist country well you know the democrats know that they have voters in their poll they're hispanic catholic voters you know they're not going to want that uh their african american constituencies are more religious than the secularists are and so they have to appeal to a bigger coalition and in the same way the republican party the Republican Party knows we can't just be the white person's party, right? I mean, we have to appeal to a lot of different voters. We have to have some outreach to minority voters. And so parties force different kinds of people to come together for the shared aim of affecting policy. And that helps to moderate the government because you're not having government by just like a splinter party. It's not as if there's a party for the trans rights activists and it's only focused on that and it gains power and that's the only issue that is cared about. Parties also help to recruit new political candidates. They serve as the uh, sort of springboard for many people to enter into political life. Uh, you know, people who get started as party activists, as party workers, they often rise through the ranks and sometimes become political candidates at the local and state level in their own right. And so parties help to vet potential leaders. And in general parties, they, they simply elevate the quality of American democracy because what parties do is they give the voters a way to influence policy. Uh, they, they serve as a vehicle for the voters to actually make a difference in what the government does. Some of you may have wondered, why do we have a two-party system? There are all these other countries in the world that have what's called a multi-party system, right? Uh, so a multi-party system, like in Switzerland, this would be the kind of system where you have, you have your far-right party, you have your socialist party, you have your kind of moderate liberal party, you have your moderate conservative party, like, you know, you 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 can uh, just pick out exactly the right party for your beliefs, right? Because all the parties, uh, you have tons of parties for each different ideological group. Well, that's obviously very different than the two party system that we have, where it's like you have one big Republican party and one big Democratic party. And you have a bunch of third parties that are probably not going to win their races. Why do we have a two party system? Well, there's actually a very short answer. Like this question might on the surface sound like it have some really profound complex answer or something, but actually no, it's very simple. We have a two party system because we have a winner take all system of electoral apportionment. That means that if you lose the election, it doesn't matter if you lose with 45% of the vote or 48% of the vote, you get none of the representation, you get none of the electoral votes in a presidential race. And so the winner take all system, it locks out parties that can't appeal to it, a lot of people, you know, 40, 45, 50%. Like if, if your party can't possibly receive 50% of the vote, it's not going to be a major party. Uh, and so that's why we have a two party system. We have a winner take all system. Let me highlight this for you by showing you this famous election, the 2000 election, uh, when uh, President Bush and Al Gore were against each other. This is one of the closest elections ever, probably the closest, closest election ever. I mean, it's virtually a tie in terms of the, uh, they, they both get roughly 48% of the vote, but it's even closer in the states. If Al Gore would have won New Hampshire, he'd have won the election. Um, and in the same way, if George W. Bush would have lost Florida, he'd have lost the election. So let's look at Florida, which was the notoriously close state here. Bush wins 25 electoral votes from Florida. But take a look at this. He wins by 537 votes in the state of Florida. So the margin is 48.847 versus 48.838. I mean, just the, the narrowest margin in the world. I mean, you... 
you could have had like two percent you could have had one percent of Florida's population get up on the wrong side of the bed that day and not show up at the polls and that that could have affected who became president of the United States you know 537 in a state as big as Florida that's nothing well in our system which is winner take all even though George W. Bush won by this very, very, very slim margin, he gets all the electors. So it's not as if it's an even split, basically. Um, in a, in a multi-party system or a proportional system, uh, you would get 48% of the vote if you got 48% of the vote. Um, I'm going to go back to that. That was a little... So, so yeah, he gets everything, even though he wins by a slim margin. And that's different than the multi-party systems, which have what are called proportional systems. So, sorry, I was getting a little out of myself because I hadn't introduced proportional representation yet. Proportional representation would be that if you win 48% of the vote, you get 48% of the electors. So if we look at that election, the Florida election, if you had had a proportional system in Florida, you basically would have had George W. Bush gets half of Florida's electors and Al Gore gets the other half of Florida's electors. That's what a proportional system would do. If you win 48%, you get 48%. Um, yeah, Seth? Is that the first election where the popular vote went to the president of the world? Not the first. No, we've had several like that. Um, we've had, so that happened in uh, 1876. It happened in... Um, Benjamin, uh, the Benjamin Harrison and Grover Cleveland election. Uh, I think Cleveland won the popular vote and still lost the electoral college. And before, but I think that it was the most high profile. Like it, it, it was the first one in like the, the modern age. And so it, it led to a lot of like outcry from people. <clears throat> and uh, in any case, the proportional systems in Europe, they create a multi-party system because if you win 10% of the vote, you still get 10% of the representation. So just think about that. You could be a very fringe ideological party. You could be like the Green Party or something. You could be the environmentalist party that could never possibly reach 50% of the voters, but you might get 10, you might get 5%. And they actually get something. Uh, they actually get seats in the parliament, because if you win 5% of the votes, you get 5% of the seats. So that's the simple difference. Proportional representation, if you win 5%, you get 5%. Uh, it's proportional to how many votes you get. Whereas in a multi, in a winner-take-all system, it doesn't matter if you lose with 48%. If you lose, you get nothing. Um, so you can see how the winner-take-all system would kind of box out the parties that can only win, like with they can only get 10% of the votes or something. So that's why we have a two-party system. But couldn't, couldn't there be an advantage to this? So the disadvantage is clear, right? The disadvantage is that, well, I mean, voters would have more choices if we had more parties. If we had an election system where the Libertarian Party could win things, the Democrats could win, the Republicans could win, the, uh, you know, the Constitution Party could win, like, you'd have a more democratic system in the sense that the voters would have more choices. But here's the catch. Do you want a system? I mean, this is a real controversy. Would, would you want a system, which means that the Communist Party can win 5% or 10% of the vote and get 10% of the seats? Or the, the Nazi Party, the American Nazi Party, if it wins 5%, it can get 5% of the seats. Um, and so traditionally, one of the advantages of the two-party system is that it kind of blocks the, the kind of radical fringe extreme parties. And even something like the Green Party. I mean, I think most Americans would never want to see Green Party people in positions of power, um, left or right, by the way, because, you know, they're pretty crazy, a lot of them. There are some really interesting third parties, by the way. Um, so there's a third party in Michigan, and it's called the Natural Law Party. Right. And you you hear that and you're like, wow, it might be a party about like the principles of the founders and the Declaration of Independence and and uh, Christian moral beliefs, because it's the natural law party. Well, actually, it's a, a marijuana party. Yeah. So actually, it's a pot party. And so I guess the idea is uh, the law of nature is we got to get high, man. You know, so that, that's their 
that's their idea of natural law. But uh, but thanks to our winner take all system, the natural law party of Michigan, they're not going to win seats. Um, you know, so even if they win one percent of the vote in Michigan, they're not going to get any of the representation. So you can see how this affects those third parties. <clears throat> So I've been kind of uh, addressing the third party. So, so is it a wasted vote to vote for a third party? We talked about all the reasons that these third parties like the Libertarian Party and like the Green Party, well, if you vote for them, you basically can say goodbye to your chances of winning the actual election. So is it not a wasted vote? What would you guys say? What? You know, is it is it ever worthwhile to vote for a third party? And if so, why? Yeah, Gavin. Yes, they sort of. So the the Whig Party collapsed. Uh, the Whig Party in the second party system was fractured because of the slavery issue. You had pro-slavery Whigs, you had anti-slavery Whigs, you had Whigs that didn't want to touch the issue. And the Whig Party couldn't come up with an answer to the slavery problem. And so the Whig Party collapses and the Republican Party wins whenever there is a split Democrat party. I mean, really both parties collapsed in the years before the 1860 election. Uh, so the Republicans started as a third party, but even then they started as a third party, but they won the election because the major parties died, basically. I mean, they, they ceased to be coherent parties. You have the Democrats split in two, you have the Whigs gone, basically. That was a mess. I mean, I wouldn't compare any election right now to, to that system. So I wouldn't look forward to the Libertarians winning and becoming the major party in the next election. Um, but yeah, the Republicans, they started as a third party, but once they won the election, they want to be a major party and they are a major party from that point on. Uh, we, I mean, the fact that we've had Democrats and Republicans fighting each other since 1860. I mean, that attests to how strong and entrenched our two-party system is. I mean, I think it's very hard to imagine our two-party system disappearing anytime soon. But what if the goal of voting third party isn't actually to win, right? So if your goal, yeah, Seth, do you want to add to that? Would it just be like more of a symbolic thing? You're kind of like mm -hmm. saying that because your party like nominated somebody who you think is bad, you're foregoing your vote for that person to kind of show that when you wouldn't vote for the green part of that party? Yeah, you could do that. That's something that could lead to changes, right? I mean, if enough people, you could imagine, if enough people said, I hate Joe Biden and they're Democrats and he bleeds so many Democratic voters, well, the Democratic candidate in not in a our next election, you might have to be very different. And same with Trump. Like if you had enough people just leave because they don't want to vote for Trump, well, you know, they're going to have to change. And so if your goal is to actually to change one of the major parties, voting third party can actually be a good way to do that. So remember back to that Florida election, um, the 537 votes that gave George W. Bush Florida. Ralph Nader, have any of you heard of this guy? So he was the Green Party candidate in 2000 and then again in 2004. So what's going on in this political cartoon? So Nader, he's the really, really left-wing candidate, right? And why, so the Republicans, they're jumping for joy, right? They love it because he's announcing his campaign in 2004. So why would that be? Well, they're, because Nader cost Gore the election in 2000. That 537 votes that Bush won with, well, Gore, he he won like 3,000 or 2,000 votes in Florida or something. Well, he's a really, really leftist guy. I mean, how many of those votes do you think would have gone to George W. Bush? I mean, probably none, right? And so Gore, he's thinking, if you Nader voters would have just voted for me, even though I'm not quite as crazy as, as uh, Nader is, and yes, he used the word crazy whenever he defended himself, I'm not as crazy as, as Nader. If you would have just voted for me, then you'd have gotten a more liberal president. But what ends up happening? So Nader costs Gore Florida and thus the election. So what do the Democrats do? Well, they have to get those voters back. 
in the next election. And so they start to emphasize environmentalist issues a lot more. And so the Green Party kind of gets the last laugh because, yeah, they cost four in 2000. But looking at the long game, they kind of forced the Democrats to pick up more issues and to emphasize issues that they cared about more. And that's what's called the spoiler, the spoiler rule. Um, you know, the third parties can spoil things for the major candidates and then force the major parties to do something different in the next election. So if your goal is simply to win with the Green Party candidate, yeah, I mean, that's not ever going to happen. But if your goal is to actually like change the major parties, third parties can actually do that. I mean, you could imagine if enough voters went into the libertarian fold in this election, you might see the Republicans become more libertarian. Um, so, yeah, so that's just the, the last point for today. Thank you, guys.